Joan Marsh, if you could go back in time and meet 16-year-old Harry Webb, what advice would you give him? Don't do it. <laughs> no, I wouldn't say that. I've actually loved my career. I'd be frightened to give myself advice at that age because, you know, and again, I've said this before, but if you like where you are, what you are, who you are now, and I do, I like, I, I'm very happy about myself and where I am and the things I get the chance to do, the concerts, everything is still fantastic for me. I would be frightened to advise myself way back in 16, it would be 1956, I would be frightened to advise that Harry in case he did something completely different and then everything would be different. Everything, I would, there'd be no guarantee that I'd end up feeling good about myself or happy about my career or anything like that. So the only thing I'm tempted to say is I would say to him, don't ever give any one-to-one -one interviews. That means, you know, you've heard about conferences. You go and sit with a dozen or more press people. They all ask you different questions. You answer to all of them. But sometimes you sit with one interviewer. And very often they're okay, but very often they are not. I have been so disappointed and hurt by some of the things people have written after doing what they call a one-to-one -one interview. So that's the only thing I'd say to him. If you get away with it, don't do them. <laughs> anyway, um, Sue Basham says, what is the most difficult task that you have had to encounter and succeeded at? Well, I suppose top of the list would have to be the fact that I dared do Heathcliff. You know, everybody said, you know, you're never going to be able to do it. Again, the press said, you can't do it. You won't do it. Why waste your time? And in a way, they egged me on. Some of you also know this from the age of about 18, and I've got a newspaper cutting somewhere where I actually said to a press man, um, they said, what would, you, what would you like to do? And I said, you know, if I could get a straight acting role in a, in a play or a musical, I'd like to do it. And my ambition is to play Heathcliff. Do you know, I can't even remember saying that when I was 18 or 19, whatever it was, but there it was in black and white. So it's been an ambition of mine for a long time. And so for me to actually dare to do it, it was quite a difficult part to play. It was totally unlike me completely. Remember, I smashed my brother, stepbrother to pulp. I beat my pregnant wife to the ground. I took them to dinner afterwards, of course, but you know, it was really quite a difficult role to play. And I felt that I did, you know, I did good in it, I felt. And so for me, I, and we succeeded, you know, in a, in a six month period, by four and a half months, and remember, we didn't play regular theaters, we played big arenas. Uh, we had broken even. There are some shows that go in the West End and after two and a half years don't even break even. So I felt we succeeded, so that's the one. Very difficult, and, um, but it, it succeeded. Uh, one other time I thought was really difficult. I had the most terrible flu, had finished doing a tour, having had to cancel a show, and I think it was Birmingham, it was Birmingham. I did the Millennium Show at Birmingham, had to cancel two shows because I got flu and I couldn't speak. I finally got back and managed to croak my way through the last two of them. And then, believe it or not, I had to go to Cardiff and do a TV show. And that was so hard. I could have just wanted, I just wanted to go to, it, it, into bed and just die. Anyway, that was very difficult, tough. It's always difficult for us, and that's the pressure for singers. All you go do is wake up in the morning and say, please God, let my voice be all right for tonight. And just sometimes it isn't. But uh, I don't blame him though. You know, if you get flu, it could be somebody else's fault, somebody breathing on you at a hall. I don't, you know, if you think about it, the, it, like if you go and play the, the arena in Birmingham, it holds 12,000 people, and it's usually in the winter. You've only got to have 100 people with flu. They don't mean to pass it on, but if once it gets in that conditioner, then all of us backstage get it too. So I'm not blaming you either, but I don't blame God for it. But that was tough. I don't know whether I've got a good answer for this one. It's from Marguerite Wood, and she's okay, Cliff, answer me this one. Where has my God gone? All my life, God has been with me. However, these last two years, he seems to have disappeared. I lost my mum, mother and father-in-law, all in three months. My husband diagnosed and died two months later with cancer. The love of my life, my rock. 45 years married, one year later, I myself diagnosed with cancer. But thankfully for my children and grandchildren, they're all okay. Um, my son's marriage has broken up and he's living with me, so where is my God now? Uh, Marguerite, you know, this is like a, a terrible plot in a very sad movie. I mean, I can only say I can't believe that so much happens to one person, but you're not the only one. I, I, I've had letters like this from other people. And you know, I don't know. Uh, I don't believe that God has gone away. 
it's just been a time and it's really, really tough for you. But you have to remember, we're told, and I believe it too, that God is a merciful God. When you've had people pass from your life, li life and death are, are linked. We live and we die, and there's no guarantee how long we get. That's the, that's the trouble with it all. And so therefore, I hope you don't blame God for it. You maybe feel bereft of Him because of the terrible story you're telling us here. This is an awful thing for one human being to, to deal with. And I sincerely hope and pray that you have good friends that can cuddle you every now and then and try and console you. I only know one thing. The, the book in the Bible that was one of the most impressive to me was about Job. I don't even know if Job ever existed. Most of the people in the Bible, if not all of them, did exist. You know, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Jesus, Moses, all those other people, you know they existed. I don't know if there's proof that Job existed. But as a school, uh, you were a Sunday school teacher, I know, so you'll, you'll know about Job. In the story of Job, he didn't just lose something of his. He did. He lost possessions. He lost his wife. He lost all his children. He lost his job. He lost all his money. Everything went down the tubes. Now, the story um, is not... They didn't want to sort of uh, make us feel bad by telling a story like this. It's the fact that Job's faith, remained strong in the time of turmoil and loss and it, rem it reminds me of you and I just hope and pray that maybe you will be able to you know get on your knees one night and say help me and, and be my be my comforter and uh, I feel com I feel confident that he's there uh, m maybe sometimes when we have hard times we forget to talk to him because there's so much hard I mean I find it's just with my career I've often said to my friends, I feel bad sometimes that days go by when I don't even think about God. And uh, there are things that take us away from it. So I don't know if it's an answer at all, but I just know that Job would be a great example of how we sh could try to behave in, in the light of terrible, terrible tragedies that in your case, Margaret, you've had to face. I'm, I'm sorry, I, I can't give a better answer than that. I'm not even sure it's any good, but thank you for your question. Okay, um, let's have a look, a, a, little, a lighter note. But this is from... Cindy Singer Thomas. I don't know if it's Cindy or Singer, whose surname is Thomas, but anyway, it says it's Cindy Singer Thomas. What would you do if today was your last day on earth? Do you know what? I'd very quickly arrange the dinner with Maggie Thatcher, Billy Graham, Elvis, and Churchill. That's what I'd do for my last day. And this is from Drew Richardson. Cliff. Would you ever consider forgetting the radio stations and record companies and record an album of new material for your own pleasure and selling at concerts and for downloads only? It seems a little unfair that the fans should miss out on such releases uh, ever recurring again because of foolish radio stations and record companies. Yes, I mean, I, I don't know how to get into the internet. You know, I don't know how people know who to log on to, you know, unless for instance, you've heard a record on the radio and heard a name somewhere or read it, what would you know to print out? How would you know what to type out? So in the end, I still rely on radio. But you know, it is a great idea, except for one thing. The, the download idea is terrific. Do an album that's strictly available for download. That's a feasible thing. That's possible. Um, the other thing is that selling them at concerts it's really tough. I've asked this of the record company and management so many times when I go on tour, even in the past, why didn't we sell them? Why didn't we have merchandising? Apparently, the halls and places that we work at demand such a massive percentage, much more than ever I would get on an album, that in the end they say, look, it's just not worth the, you know, shipping it down, tra traveling it around, having people pay to sell it. It's just not worthwhile. So there you go. That one seems to be out of the question. But yes, it's very tempting and you know, you've just got to watch this space. There are so many things that I could do that are different and exciting for me and uh, that would, I think, be one of them. Anyway, now here's the last question for this time anyway. I'll try and do this again. I think it's pronounced Mariek Honsbeek. Mariek Honsbeek. Uh, what do you think of your own popular, my own popular Facebook page and do you read some of the messages of yourself? As I said to you at the beginning, I, you know, I'm, I'm heavily not into technical things. I've only just got my, my own personal iPad. Everybody in my office uses computers and iPads, um, and so therefore I usually get them to do my talking for me. But uh, I've managed to get this uh, 
second-hand iPad, <laughs> and um, I will probably be able to write a little bit more. I mean, I know that I've only got to write a line or two, and I'm going to try and do that in the future. And yet, I have read some of your messages, but this is the first time I've ever felt I'm, you know, up to actually answering them personally like this. So I'm very happy about fa the Facebook page. I don't know how to gauge its success, but um, if, uh, if more than a few of you watch and read and, and comment, then I guess it's successful. So thank you very much for that, and I hope that this has been of interest to you. It's been of interest to me. And um, as I say, the only one I'd like to mention again is Marguerite Wood, if you're still watching. Uh, I I'm so sorry that I couldn't give you a better answer. There is really no answer to suffering in this world. I only know that God exists and He loves. And He loves everybody, and He's loved the people you've lost. And they're probably ahead of us in heaven. Anyway, God bless. God bless you all, and thanks again.